Welcome her sisters and brothers. I am so honored to have Spencer Bishens here today with us. In my writing, and frankly, as we've talked on the podcast, you know I am a huge advocate of reaching out for support whenever you need. And I am someone who's also had to advocate for a family member, a close family member, who is experiencing mental health problems to the extent that they could no longer work, go to school, hold a job, or live alone. And I found that experience to be god awful. In the middle of a horrible family crisis, that just added one extra layer. And so sometimes dealing with the, I don't know, the unintended consequences of asking for support can be so big. Spencer Bishens is an author of a new fabulous book about how to get social, well, Social Security Disability Revealed, why it's so hard to access benefits and what you can do about it. And I want you to listen, even if you don't have a family member who is dealing with issues needing Social Security benefits, because it really has a bigger umbrella. Whenever you access government support, there are some takeaway lessons in here, and a lot of us will be dealing with Social Security at some point or another. Spencer is a lawyer. He is licensed in Florida, lives, has lived in Tacoma, Washington, and worked for the Social Security Administration for 11 years. Spencer, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's huge that you wrote this book. It was very daring of you. I have to say, as someone who has worked in government myself, the fact that you wrote an Almost an expose is pretty fantastic, but I think there are a lot of listeners who can be served by the work that you have done. Tell me a little bit about the story behind the story. Why did you write this book? Tell me a little bit about your career and when you knew maybe you weren't serving in the way that you'd hoped to. Right. Um, and the, the thing is, the book Social Security Disability Revealed, it expose, I think, is a is a good word to describe in the sense that I'm explaining to people a lot of information that they're not going to get from anywhere else. Sure. But I don't use that word in the sense that a lot of this isn't actually a secret. A lot of this is information that is publicly available technically, but Social Security is not going to make it easy for you to find this information. But it is available. So the amount of people that file a claim every year, over a million people file a social security disability claim every wow. year. And over 70% of those people will be denied at the initial application. Okay. And, almost, and almost all of those people will be denied the second time around. And social security, they're not going to like volunteer that information. They're not going to tell you, by the way, you're probably going to get denied. But they do publish uh, charts and graphs and reports, and they don't hide it either. So this is publicly available information. But I also gained some information when I worked through my 11 years of working with Social Security that isn't necessarily publicly available. And what I want people to understand from, and this is why I wrote the book, is there are certain strategies you can use to help your case have a better chance of success than other people. It's not necessarily a coin toss or throwing darts at the board as far as whether you'll be approved or not. Most people do get denied at that initial level and again at reconsideration. But then when you go to a hearing with an administrative law judge who actually works for Social Security, the odds change and they change for a variety of reasons. You're now dealing with someone who is a federal employee, not a state employee. You're dealing with a judge who has a little bit more independence than the initial decision maker has. You have someone writing your decision. That would be me. I was a staff attorney in a hearing office, and the judges don't write their own decisions. The staff attorneys actually write the decisions. You're dealing with a staff attorney who is an attorney, whereas the people at the initial and reconsideration levels are, as I talk about in the book, they're usually not. They're usually college educated $40,000 a year state level bureaucrats and they see 
an enormous volume of cases and there's a lot of pressure on them to keep cases moving. Um, things change a little bit when you get to the hearing level. And so understanding the system, understanding how the hearing office operates, who the judges are, how the judges are hired, how your hearing's gonna go, knowing who's gonna appear at your hearing and why there's gonna be people who talking about you who've never met you, you have to know these things, right? You have to know what's gonna happen, what kind of evidence you need to submit, how that hearing is gonna play out. You have to know these things so you can understand them and you have to understand them so that you can prepare for them because being prepared is what ultimately gives you the best chance of having a successful disability claim. That's so incredible because when you think about it, I, and I wanna rewind for a minute and see, what kinds of cases are people mostly applying for? Because I know I was dealing with mental health and yeah. in my work as a probation officer, we also apply for social security benefits for juveniles, mostly dealing with mental health for them as well. But think about people who are trying to manage mental health debilitating symptoms, and then they're supposed to understand layer upon layer <laughs> Of yeah. all of this, as they're going through the process of asking for support, it's just a lot to ask. So, you know, I want to hear what primarily kind of cases you were getting in, in volume and also who are the advocates that could help someone who couldn't navigate the system on their own? Let's just touch on that real fast, because that's an easier question to answer. Okay. Um, Social Security representatives, which can be lawyers or non-lawyers, non-attorney mm -hmm. representatives, you may have seen advertising on TV where someone says like, we don't get paid unless you win. Right. That's true. And a lot of those lawyers will advertise like daytime television because those spots are cheaper. And they presume that if you're not working, maybe you're watching TV during the day. Well, anyway, that's true. They okay. don't get paid unless you get a favorable decision. And in the book, I talk about who the representatives are, how their offices operate, how they actually get paid how to find one, how to fire your representative in case you need to find a new one. Good. I cover all that in the book because it is important to have a good quality professional representative who knows the social security judges, rules, procedures, the rules for evidence, all that. Okay. But I do stress in the book, what most people do is they'll hire a representative and then forget about it. I got my lawyer handling it. Okay. I talk to my lawyer, my lawyer handles it. I don't have to do anything till I show up for the hearing. And that's a huge mistake because as I talk about in the book, these law firms that handle social security cases, there's a cap on how much they can earn per case. Okay. And it's only about $7,000. And when you're operating a law office with the amount of time and effort that they have to put into these cases and having a staff, a secretary, a paralegal, it's not a lot of money. $7,000 for a law office. And so it's a volume business for them. They have a lot of clients. And that means that they can't really hold your hand through this process. They don't have time to explain to you how it works. They'll meet with you for an hour. They'll go with you to your hearing. But if you don't understand what's going on, if you don't know what kind of evidence you need when you talk to your doctor, if you don't know what you need in a medical opinion when you meet with your doctor, if you don't know how to present your case, you're not gonna, you're unlikely to have a very good outcome. So it's important to have a representative or an advocate, but it's equally as important to participate on your own, or if you can't, to have a friend or family member close to you who can help you at every step of the process so that you can work with your attorney to present the best case possible. Now we'll turn back to your first question. The most common reason for applying for social security disability are musculoskeletal cases. A lot of people have very physical jobs. And you know, if you start working at 18 to 20 years old, by the time you get to 40, 45, your knees, your back, they wear out. The discs in our back and the ligaments in our knees or our shoulders, they're not meant to sustain eight to 10 hour work days, five to six days a week over decades. Mm -hmm. And they just wear out over time. 
And so that's the most common reason that people apply for social security disability. Back impairments is number one, and it's not even close. Mental health impairments are up there though. We're talking about anxiety, depression, PTSD, personality disorder. Among others, there are others like neurocognitive disorder or intellectual disability. And it's important to remember that sometimes that's a primary impairment Sometimes it's the secondary impairment. And what I mean by that is maybe you're applying because you have a back impairment or a knee impairment or emphysema or cancer. And then because you're not working and you can't pay your bills and you're getting denied by social security and you feel like no one's listening to you or believing you, people get anxious, they get depressed. And then that onsets as a secondary impairment. Okay. And it may also be a reason why they can't work, but it I call it a secondary impairment because it onset due to the primary impairment. But there are a lot of people, I would say a majority of the cases had some kind of mental health impairment, whether it be primary or secondary. A majority of the cases that I saw had an allegation of, usually it's depression, anxiety, or PTSD. Those, in my experience, were the most common three. And you're right, it is very difficult for someone who has a mental health impairment to manage trying to find a job, maybe trying to do a part-time job, trying to get the care they need, trying to pay for that care if they have no health insurance because they've lost their full-time job, right. trying to get good documentation, dealing with the person at the social security office, filling out the application, filling out the function reports, filling them out again when they get lost inevitably, and then you know, after all of that, getting denied by Social Security, not once, but twice. Right. And you're statistically very likely to get denied two times before you can even get to a hearing with a judge. And for that hearing, you're probably going to have to wait between 12 and 15 months on top of the three to six months you've already waited. Right. So for most people, this is not a sprint. It is a marathon throughout the medical process. And then it's another marathon throughout this legal process within Social Security. Meanwhile, that whole two or three year period of time, you're not working full time. You're not bringing in a full time income. You maybe have no health insurance. It's a lot, even if your impairment is a physical impairment. Right. That person who got hurt working because they their job involved heavy lifting, maybe they were a delivery driver or they worked in a warehouse that person who gets hurt and has to deal with all of this it's not that different from the person who couldn't work because of depression or anxiety they're dealing with a lot they're dealing with a system that is setting them up to fail they're dealing with a system that wants to keep people out and does not want people to get disability benefits so whatever the basis you're applying for disability is you are pushing back against this wave of policies and procedures that are coming at you and all of these barriers that are being put in your way intentionally to keep you from getting those benefits. Right. I remember hearing when I was applying for benefits, and I'm so fortunate that I worked for government at the time, or I wouldn't have heard this, hey, you're going to be denied twice off the top. So just know that. And then, you know, keep trying and pushing it forward. But that paperwork, I felt like it was so extensive. I could have bought a house. It was document after document after document and symptom after symptom. And I just thought if it was the person themselves who was dealing with the psychosis at the time, if we relied on that person to fill it all out and to have, keep documentation and submit it in a timely fashion, it would have never happened. Right. So I just talked about the barriers that are going to be put up along the way. And that's a that's a pretty broad, nebulous phrase. So let's just talk about exactly, specifically what barriers you have. The first one is if you can't work, maybe you lose your health insurance because 80% of Americans get health insurance through work. So maybe then you can't access treatment or you live in a rural area and there's no orthopedist mm -hmm. or respiratory doctor or, or psychiatrist in your town. There's just one family doctor. So those are some barriers. Even if you can get some treatment, maybe you have difficulty getting the documentation you need, either because that doctor's just too busy or you don't know what specific documentation you need 
because the person at the social security office has just said, oh, just give us your medical records, but they haven't told you specifically what records they need to approve your claim. More barriers are the application, the function reports, having to fill them out multiple times. Those are, every single time you have to do something, that's a barrier to entry. And there are people who will not overcome that barrier. Right. Let's talk about the two denials. There's a lot of reasons for these denials, but I'll give you what I think is the most significant reason. And that is, it, you're not only keeping people out of the process by denying them, but there's a 60 day appeal window. And a lot of people, especially if they don't have an advocate or attorney or other representative helping them, a lot of people just miss the appeal window. So if you deny over 70% of claims, there are people who get approved at that initial level. I know someone who did, but he had like months of hospitalization and thousands of pages of medical records. Mm -hmm. And that's just not most people, right? Most right. people have disorganized records, incomplete records, and they don't know any better just because in the United States, our employment system's a mess, our healthcare system's a mess, and our medical record system, keep, uh, our, medical, our system of keeping medical records is a mess. Right, like it wasn't that long ago that I went to get my own medical records and the doctor said, what's your fax number? We'll fax them to you. <laughs> like I had a fax machine at home, right. right? So people don't have great records and then they get denied and social security knows they have statistics. We're talking millions of cases over the last 10 years. So they have really good statistics. They know when they deny people, they know what percentage are not even going to appeal. You go to a second case, they deny almost everyone at that second level, and they know more people are going to peel off. So all throughout this process, you have people self-selecting out of the process because they give up, they, or they either they can't get good documentation, or they don't think they can, or it's too much, or they can't get to that doctor, or Social Security tells you to go see a doctor and you miss the appointment. And if they tell you you have to go see a doctor and you miss the appointment, they'll just dismiss your case for non-cooperation. But if you can get through this gauntlet, you get denied. Maybe you think, oh, I guess if Social Security tells me I can work, I guess I can work. You give up. It happens a second time. You give up or you didn't want to give up, but you missed your appeal window. And if you missed that appeal window, that is pretty objectively like you are out. You you. Oh. It is very difficult to come back from that because you have to prove why you missed the appeal window, which is like you didn't ever get that decision with your appeal notice. And you have to prove that you didn't receive something in the mail. That's like nearly impossible to prove, right? I mean, really, it takes so many resources that people who are vulnerable might not have, you know? Yeah. I mean, it literally takes a lot. Yeah, and Social Security's client... And Social Security's clients are, is not a wide cross section of America. Right. It's it's not you're not talking all income levels. Like technically you are. I saw some records with like doctors, and lawyers, and accountants, and people who are making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. But ninety five percent of cases are people who are high school or maybe not even quite high school education. They're living in rural areas. Maybe they don't have a car. They're living paycheck to paycheck or not even they're going into debt. They can't pay their bills. They can't afford to be out of work at all, right. let alone for this three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 months that social security forces you to go through the system. That's another thing. Social security knows people are vulnerable in this way. So they know if we drag this out over time, some people will have to go back to work, even if they can't they will. And when someone can't work full time for a medical reason, and they push themselves to do it, the outcomes are not good. Because right. if they truly needed those benefits, because they couldn't work 40 hours a week, and you go and you work 40 hours a week, Social Security's position was, see, I guess you could work. But what, what's happening is those people are breaking down their bodies Instead of getting treatment and helping their bodies recover so that they can go back to work, they're just they're breaking their bodies even further right. before they've gotten that medication, physical therapy, surgery, whatever. And a lot of people literally just die. 
they there does you know if you need treatment and you don't get it and instead you do the opposite right. a lot of times it causes a lot more se severe problems maybe someone just needed physical therapy for 6 to 12 months and now their back is so bad they do need surgery and a lot of back surgeries don't have good outcomes back surgeries I'm not an orthopedist or a doctor, but what I've learned is that for me to reading medical reports, if you get to the point where your back needs surgery, like that's really just to help you be in slightly less pain for the rest of your life, but it, you may never recover functionally. So the better thing to do would be to intervene before it gets too severe, get people the treatment they need. They're out of work for two or three years. And then at 49 years old, they go back to work and can work for another 15 years. Right. But if you don't intervene and that 46 year old doesn't get the care or treatment they need and they go back to work at 46, they may be permanently unable to work by 49. And now you've done a disservice to them, to their family and to the economy and the taxpayers as a whole, because right. now they're going to be getting disability benefits without paying back into the system. So it, it really, social security is, they know their clients are the most vulnerable citizens in America, but they also know they can't pay every case. That's not how the system was designed. Sure. I've told your listeners why they're so anti-payment, but I do think from social security's perspective, I'd like to be fair and just take one minute and explain why it's the case. Mm -hmm. They really operate like a private insurance company, right? They take in money and it seems like they're trying to pay as few claims as possible. But it's not a profit motive. Social security, it's the government. They're not making a profit, but they have to operate the disability program specifically like they're a profit-driven company. And the reason is social security is designed for you to pay in for like 40 years and get benefits for like four years. Okay. That's how it was initially conceived. You'd work from 25 to 65, and then you'd get benefits for a few years until you died at 69, which back then, 80 years ago, was the average lifespan, right? It's not that different today. And if the average lifespan of an American is like 72, but the retirement age has been bumped up to 67, they're still kind of planning for you to do that, for you to work for 30 to 40 years and collect benefits for like five to six years. Right. But if you then start collecting benefits in your 40s, you've only been paying in for half that time and you may be collecting benefits more than five or six years if you're permanently disabled. Right. It throws off the economics of that program in a major way. And they can't deny retirement claims, right? When you get to retirement age, you claim those benefits they're yours. Right. <laughs> but what that means is for Social Security to keep the whole program financially stable, the only place where they can really make decisions that impact the stability of the program is the disability program. Mm -hmm. So what they're forced to do then is they're forced to use the macroeconomics of the program to make decisions on individual cases. So if it looks like, uh, we need our, 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 our payout rate is too high too much money's coming out of the trust fund, what they'll do is they'll say, we have to pay fewer disability cases because that's the only place where we can make an actual decision. Right. And that's unfortunate for the people who are really vulnerable and who are relying on social security to give them a fair and unbiased view of their medical records. But social security has to balance, right? They have to balance you and your individual circumstances with the program as a whole and you know and think of it like a knob it's not so much a switch that you can lift it's more like a knob and i describe this in the book where you're make you, you can make slight changes and turn it a little bit this way and bring your approval rate from 50% overall nationally to 48% well you just denied thousands more cases than you would have right before you turn that knob Similarly, if the denial rate is getting too high, or if it looks like, you know, overall members of Congress are asking, why are you denying so many cases? They can turn it the other way and they can, you know, approve some more. And maybe right. someone who would have been not denied last year is going to be approved this year. And that's the Social Security. They're constantly deciding 
you know, do we turn the dial this way or this month or this quarter or this year? Do we have to turn it this way? And the result is that you and your individual case, you have a judge, a decision writer, and other staff who are thinking about that call that they had with management yesterday, telling them we need to deny more cases or we need to approve more cases. And so you're standing there thinking my case is getting an individualized review, but in reality, all of the social security employees are thinking also about the marching orders from headquarters and what, what we need to be doing big picture. And that does, as I talk about in the book, that does impact the outcome of your case. And I think that's so important to acknowledge because whether it's social security or any other government agency, it's not personal, but you kind of have to become an expert in the very system that you're seeking support from. And That's right. if you can't do it, then you need to find someone who is capable of that and helps you modulate your expectations and moods as you're dealing with what is likely to be a long slog before you see any relief, if you ever see any relief. Yeah. But the danger in not knowing that, of course, not getting involved. And I would say getting involved in if, when people can in peer support groups things like that, where they learn from one another, if they don't have that opportunity, they, it is very personal. It feels like this was my one chance of support. They have denied me. I guess I don't have any recourse. Yeah, what education. Yeah, education is very important. And as we draw yeah. to a close here, this is a, a really good way to conclude because the whole time I've been telling you and your listeners why social security, why the deck is really stacked against you, right? Mm -hmm. But I want people to remember that the subtitle of my book is why it's so hard to access benefits and what you can do about it. Love it. Tell so, us. So a lot of the book is a realistic, honest look at here. Are all of the reasons Social Security is going to make it really hard for you to access benefits. Sure. And I wrote for a lot of judges. Some had a higher pay rate of like 60 to 80 percent. Other judges had a lower pay rate, like 20 percent. I wrote for a lot of judges with 20% pay rates, really harsh, stern personalities. And their, their position was like, I can work. Why can't you? Okay. Or, or to me talking about the claimant, if I would bring a case and say, yeah, hey, I think we should consider approving this case. The judge would say, well, I can work. So can he, this is a denial. So I wrote for a lot of those judges. Okay. And this is the kind of thing that you're not going to find on the social security website or in any kind of publication. You talked earlier about uh, like pulling back the curtain, right? Like an expose. This is, I guess this is as close to I get with an expose is telling you there's a lot you cannot control in this process. And there are some things you can control. And what I explain in the book is you have to focus on the things you can control. Right. So one of the things you cannot control is who your judge is. They randomly assign cases to the judges. To And if you get a judge with a 20% pay rate, and let's say you somehow find that out, because that is public information, their pay mm -hmm. rate, or your attorney says, yeah, this is kind of a difficult judge. They have a 20% pay rate. This is going to be difficult. That might be kind of a downer of a situation. But if you have a hearing and the judge has four other hearings that day, and that's pretty typical for a judge to do five hearings in a day. Mm -hmm. Statistically, they are going to approve one of those cases. And the key is, and this is what I try and emphasize in the book, the key is knowing what you have to do to be that one out of five cases that day that that judge is going to approve. You have to know what kind of evidence you need, what to talk to your doctors about, what to have in a medical opinion, because doctors don't really understand how social security regulations define a medical opinion. Mm -hmm. And they'll still write like my patient can't work or my patient is disabled and that's not sufficient. That's not going to be useful to you. So you have to understand what needs to be in that medical opinion in order for the judge to actually consider that as really good evidence. Mm -hmm. But if you can get really good evidence, you make sure there are no gaps in your treatment record. You show your functional limitations for all of your impairments, whether it's your back or your wrist or mental health. And you go functionally and you show, here's all my functioning. Here's why it's diminished. Here's the evidence over time. And here's why I can't work on a full-time basis. 
A lot of medical records just don't do that. And the odds are, if you've done the things that I've suggested in this book, three of those other cases that day probably will not have. And one or two out of those other four cases, the person will even have a social security lawyer representing them to even help them at all. And probably the other two people will have a terrible disorganized medical record and no representation at all. Mm -hmm. So you can see where it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but there are strategies that you can use that you can follow so mm -hmm. that if the judge sees four other cases that day and goes denial, denial, representative, still denial, representative, good case, few gaps in the treatment record, still denial, and then they get your case, there are no gaps in the record, and your doctors have explained functionally why you can't work. Okay. That judge, even a low-paying judge, every now and then they get a case that's so airtight, they say, I just, I have discretion sometimes, but in this case, I don't have any discretion to deny this case. This one I have to approve. And that's really how those low paying judges operate. They'll use discretion to deny where they can, but mm -hmm. when there's no discretion because a case is so well presented, mm -hmm. they'll just approve it and move on. They don't care if some people get paid. They just don't want to pay the cases that they think don't deserve to be paid. So you sure. want to present your case in a way where it looks like you deserve to be paid. Right. And there are certain strategies, like I'll just throw out one more uh, strategy out of the book. Um, some people think like, I shouldn't work. I'm telling the judge I can't work, I shouldn't work. Actually, as I explained in the book, trying to work is a really, really good thing. Right. Because those low paying judges, they don't wanna just give you benefits. They wanna know that you truly need them and one way to show that is by trying to work and showing them that you can't. I right. tried to work full time. I can't do it. Here's medically what happens to me when I try and do that. And judge, that's not a good thing. So I, I, that's, that's really excellent evidence for a lot of these judges that you can't work. And there's a lot more tips and strategies like that in the book yeah. that, again, they're not really secrets so much as they're just things that social security is not going to tell you. And so the only way that you find out about these is from a resource from the inside, from someone who worked in social security, saw thousands of cases, and I wrote almost 2000 decisions. So wow. I saw thousands of medical records. I listened to thousands of hearings. I know what good case presentation looks like, and I know what convinces even low paying judges to pay cases. And so ultimately, that's what you can do about it. That's the positive takeaway is, yes, Social Security, the deck is stacked against you. Like with all public benefits, they're trying to restrict who can get them. Mm -hmm. And so you have to know what you have to do in order to be one of those people that can successfully access public benefits. And that's ultimately why I wrote the book, Social Security uh -huh. Disability Revealed, Why It's So Hard to Access Benefits and What You Can Do About It. Such a great subtitle. The whole thing is terrific. But, you know, I'm def I think most people are in agreement that we don't want people to get benefits if they don't need them. We absolutely don't. On the other hand, people who need the benefits, we want them to be able to know that if they persist and if they empower themselves with the right information like that you've supplied, there is a way that they can find relief and maybe they won't always need to not work, but this is what they need for now to survive. And perhaps if people get earlier intervention and can survive and get the support they need, they're much more likely to pay back into the system and go back to work. And almost everybody, who is getting social security disability wants to work. Right. Social security is really good at making sure people who shouldn't have the benefits don't get them. What it's not really good, very good at is making sure the people who need them can get them. A lot of people really need these benefits and they can't get them. And most of these people would tell you, I don't want to be on disability. I worked for 20 years. If I was mm -hmm. doing this on purpose, I'd have done it a lot earlier. I can't work because I can't work. Right. I need these benefits and the Medicare coverage that comes with social security disability so that I can pay my rent and buy food and get some medical care and get better because I want to go back to work. Love it. 
That's what people say when they're interviewed. And so that's who I want to help. I want to help people so that they can go get these benefits that Social Security, that the government is trying to restrict them from getting, even though they paid the tax, they paid into the system. Right. And therefore, people call it an entitlement because if you pay into the system, you should be entitled to get those benefits. Right. But it's really, as you know, it's really difficult. And I want people to understand, don't give up. There's always the next step. If you lose, you can appeal. I explain how to do that in the book. But also, by the way, if you win and you get your benefits, you can't become complacent because Social Security can and does take benefits away from people. Mm -hmm. So even if you win your case and you think this book isn't for me, it is. You can have your benefits taken away and you have to know how to avoid that and what to do when you get that letter saying, we're reviewing your claim. So this book really mm -hmm. is for, for anyone, because as you've said, we're all going to deal with Social Security at some point in our lives. We are. Maybe it's at 67. Maybe it's because a family member died and we have to file a survivor claim or we're the ones who are going to die and our families are going to have to file a survivor claim on us. Or statistically, I, and I didn't realize this until I worked for Social Security, but statistically, everyone in America knows someone, either they're, they filed a claim or they know someone who has. You don't know it because people don't advertise that kind of thing. Right. But I learned after I started working with Social Security, and then I wrote this book and I was talking to people, so many people said to me, you know, you didn't know this about me, but I actually filed a Social Security claim. Or you didn't know this and you might not know because my impairment is a non-visible impairment, but I'm actually receiving benefits. Right. It's unbelievably common. Talking over a million people a year who file a claim, over 9 million current beneficiaries, it's a massive system, and odds are, if you're listening to this podcast, you actually do know someone who has filed a claim or has filed and won a claim and they're receiving benefits. You just don't know who it is, right? but there's someone in your life who needs these benefits and who needs to understand how this system works. Anyone who's ever experienced a medical anything and found it difficult to work, that's everyone, right? Everyone at some point in your life will have an injury or illness or something, and you'll find that it's difficult to work. So you have to know how the system works, how to navigate it, and what to do if you find yourself or someone you know finds themselves in that situation. Spencer, where can listeners get a hold of you and your book? What's the best one place that people can find more about your work? The best one place is our website, Bishon's. Okay publishing.com. That's B-I-S-H-I-N-S publishing.com. That's my Perfect. last. Bishons publishing.com. Okay. We have a description of the book, the table of contents. We have links to social media. Uh, we have interviews, articles that the editor of the book, my wife, has written. We also have links for all the places to buy the book, an ebook and paperback, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble. If you want to support your local bookstore, you can do it through bookshop.org. You can also ask your local library to get the book in paper book, uh, paperback or ebook formats. And if you click that word request, we have the ISBN for both of those. Smart. Give that information to your library and they can get it in ebooks. You can get it through OverDrive or Hoopla and get it immediately. Or they can order a paperback and you can take it home with you and feel it and flip through it and all that fun stuff. I love that you have that free option there, though, so people can understand. Because a lot of times when we're going through a crisis, we don't have the extra dollars to spend on a book. So getting it through a local library is such a terrific way to have access. And it provides access for other people. Yeah. You've made it super simple. So thank you so much for being here. I love the work that you're doing. And I think it really helps a lot of people, not just who need social security, but understanding that every system that they apply for assistance from will have their own set of rules, their own limitations, and it requires a lot of grit to make it through. And so you've cracked the code on social security, and I think that's fabulous. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me.
I always forget how to track recording.